let's let's take our Bibles this evening. And I want us to read Acts chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. And this is truly a church-changing moment in history, this passage of Scripture, as we see the first missionary sent out on purpose by the local church, Acts chapter 13, and we'll read verses 1 through 5. If you have your Bible open, let's all just read it out loud together. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. They being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed to Seleucia and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Amen. Henry Martin, the great missionary to India said, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. And the nearer we get to him, the more intensely missionary we must become. So this is a missionary passage of scripture. And it is one of the reasons the local church will always be an absolute necessity on earth until Jesus Christ comes again. As we see missionaries sent out from the local church to go and fulfill the command of Jesus Christ and the, the heart of the Holy Spirit to go. So let's pray as we begin. Now, Lord, take this time and use it for your honor and for your glory. And we thank you for your love. Thank you for your church. Thank you, Lord, that your church will never be obsolete with all the technology that we have, that your church will always be the an absolute necessity for us to to go to, to gather uh, with the assembly of saints, to pray, to, to worship, to fellowship, and to grow as disciples of you, and to send forth servants, missionaries, to the uttermost parts of the world. And so, Lord, help our church to be like this church of Antioch. Help us to even see people saved, baptized, called to preach, and send out missionaries, or help us to send others out and and or to assist in the sending forth of others uh, who need that who need those financial supports as well. So, Lord, bless us tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I asked this morning in my email, "Do you know who this is?" Somebody quickly responded and said, "That's your dad and mom, and that's you when you were a baby." So I said, "I said that's pretty good, but that's not true." This is Roger and Barbara Udarian. And we probably better know Jim Elliott and Nate Saint of these five missionaries who went to Ecuador and then died martyrs' deaths in 1956. Roger Udarian is probably not and is not the best known amongst them, but he has a very amazing testimony and he has a wonderful story behind him. So as he was called to go with these other men to reach this, this unreached tribe of the Horani Indians in deep in the jungles of Ecuador, he wrote a poem just as he was going. And this is the poem he wrote. There is a seeking of honest love drawn from a soul storm tossed, a seeking for the gain of Christ to bless the blinded, the beaten, the lost. Those who sought found heavenly love and were filled with joy divine. They walked today with Christ above. And he couldn't think of the last line. And he said, I'll finish it. That, that rhymes, doesn't it? I didn't even mean to do that. He said, I'll finish it when I come home. He left his home December 19th, around in there, before Christmas. And on January 8th, less than a month after going to reach this people group, he was dead. 
And so I would like to suggest a line for the, to finish that poem. First, I just want to say a couple things about Roger Udarian. Before he even went and teamed up with these other missionaries, he was ready to quit. He was ready to go home. He said, I'm about ready to call it quits. There's no future for us here. The wisest thing is to pull up stakes. This is what he wrote. The reason? Failure to measure up as a missionary, to get next to the people. As far as my heart, the issue is settled. I'm not fooling myself. This is what he said. I wouldn't support a missionary such as I know myself to be. I'm not going to ask anyone else to support me. The issue is personal. I'm discouraged about finding a satisfactory solution. He was going to quit. He was going to come home. Why is that? Well, when you actually look at, he was only in Ecuador for less than maybe about three years, maybe less. But he wasn't a failure in the short time he was there. His first year in Ecuador, he worked with the Javaro people who were steeped in witchcraft, sorcery, and revenge killing. He learned their language, developed a literacy program, reached them by going through, through mud up to his knees, beating off, beating off snakes along the way. And Nate Saint, the famous jungle pilot, said he had a real urgency for the task of winning souls. He spent hours in the homes of this, these Javaro people, slowly acquiring their language, absorbing their way of life, above all, telling them the story of Jesus. Hey. Is that a failure? That's not a failure. The second year he was there, he heard of a tribe that needed medical supplies because the tribe was being weakened by disease and illness. But there, there was no access by plane to this tribe. Somebody had started a, a, uh, an area where a plane could land, but had not finished it. And so for this daunting task, Raj Hudarian went basically by himself to finish an airstrip so a plane could land, so medicine could get to this tribe in desperate need. And he was there. And that poem said, for the gain of Christ, to bless the blinded, the beaten, and the lost. See, so when Roger Udarian, by the way, if you go back to this poem, and he wrote, he said, there is a seeking of honest love drawn from a soul storm-tossed. Who was the, the storm tossed? He was. He was discouraged. He was ready to quit. He felt like a failure. But he still wanted to bless who? The blinded, the beaten, the lost. And so he was confronted with the opportunity to go with the other missionaries to reach this unreached people group. And after he helped to make that. Uh, airstrip, Nate Saint and Jim Elliott and the others asked Roger to join their team. And it was a desperate struggle for him. And he prayed, but God brought him to the place where he said, yes, I will go with you. And this is what he wrote on December 19th, again, less than a month before he were to die. He said, I will die to self. This is how we have to live the Christian life. I will die to self. I will live unto God, that I may learn to love him with all my heart. And here he found heavenly love. So, of course, he went, and there he died on what they called Omaha Beach. And there he was buried in a grave with two of the other men. He was pierced through with a javelin as they were trying to bring the gospel to these very... Uh, Difficult people know that had never been reached by, by uh, people outside of, of, their, of their culture. He followed Christ. You know, when he got saved, when he was saved in the military, and he had polio. Roger Udarian suffered with polio from the age of nine. He walked like an old man. But yet, in World War II, you know what he was? He was, 
he jumped from airplanes, <laughs> even though he had that physical problem in his life. And he got saved when he was in, in the army while he was in Berlin during World War II. And he said, ever since I've accepted Christ, I felt the call to either mis missionary or ministerial work. I want to follow Jesus every second of my life. That was his heart. So now here he was. He's had a few seconds to live. And he said, I will go to these Harani Indians. And he gave his life in doing it. So his poem is, there is a seeking of honest love drawn from a soul storm tossed, a seeking for the gain of Christ to bless the blinded, the beaten, the lost. And I really believe that that's his testimony. Those who sought found heavenly love. They were filled with joy divine. They walk today with Christ above. And here's my suggestion. You can think of yours forever with Jesus to shine. And I do believe he's shining with Jesus even now in heaven. So here we see in the book of Acts, the first missionaries sent out. How many thousands of missionaries have been sent out since then? Since then, who have even given their lives like these five martyrs for Christ, but many others who haven't given their lives in death, but give their lives to live for Jesus. So this church of Antioch, is truly the model missionary church. Jerusalem may have been the first church, the mother church, but now Antioch becomes the model church, the church that sets a pattern for us and for every other local church that wants to fulfill the Great Commission. And I believe here is a turning point in history because it's the first time that out of spirit-filled obedience, a church sends forth missionaries. Now. There had been a persecution earlier in Acts chapter 8, and people went everywhere preaching the word, but that was a forced preaching, if you will. And it was even out of that that the church of Antioch was started. When there was a persecution in the church, people went everywhere preaching the word, and some went as far as Antioch, and there the church of Antioch started. But this now, the church of Antioch, sends forth missionaries to fulfill the Great Commission, and to fulfill the work that the Holy Spirit was telling them needed to be done. So just quickly this evening, I want us to look at three great works of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in this church. And by the way, this is a great text for the deity of the Holy Spirit. And we do believe in the triunity of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because look at even where it says in verse 2, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So it's as if, yes, the Holy Spirit is God, and he is God of the church. And so we see three great works of the Holy Spirit. And the first thing we see about the Holy Spirit here is that the Holy Spirit speaks to the church. It says as in verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, so I'm going to just stop right there. The Holy Ghost said, the Holy Spirit speaks personally to the church on who is even to go in fulfilling the Great Commission. The Holy Ghost said, we must be sensitive to listen and to hear the voice of the Spirit of God speaking through his word to our hearts. The Holy Ghost said, he said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work. And it says in verse one, now there were in the church that was at Antioch. The Holy Ghost said, who did the Holy Ghost said, say to? Who is the Holy Spirit speaking to here? He was speaking to the church, to the church body. So think about this church for a moment and just Think about this church. I'd say, first of all, it was a grace-filled church. Go back to Acts chapter 11, when it, was, when it was first started in Acts chapter 11. And who's got verse 23? Who could stand and read verse 23? Acts chapter 11, verse 23. Quick, who's got it? Kristen? 
Haman had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of their heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Amen. He saw the grace of God. It was a grace-filled church. And verse 26 is one of the great verses of the New Testament, I believe. I love this verse 26. Who's, who could read that verse for us? What does it say? Okay. And a faith? When he had finished him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass. For the whole year that it, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Okay, that's right. Thank you, Anna Faith. They were called Christians first. The grace of God was at work. Barnabas and Paul were working together. And another thing I want us to notice about this church, it was an, an autonomous church. In other words, it was an independent church. This church was not under the authority of any other local church. It was under the authority of who? Of Jesus Christ, of God the Father, of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke directly to the church. Separate me. Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So it wasn't another church that came and said, you've got to send Barnabas and Saul. It says in verse 1, now there was in the church. That was at Antioch. So it was an autonomous church. Every local church is autonomous. That is independent. An assembly of called out believers in Jesus Christ commissioned to obey the great commission. That's our function. And Jesus Christ is the head of this church. And the Holy Spirit is the one who speaks, yea, to us through the word of God. It's an autonomous church. And I love how this church was so diverse. Look at this verse. We see there are such diverse ethnicities in the church there's jew and gentile there's different cultures there's roman there's jewish there's african in this church look at the names barnabas who was jewish and simeon that was called niger niger means black so there was black men in this church and then it says Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was an African nation. Some say, Henry Morris actually in his study Bible says that may have been the one who helped Jesus carry the cross. Simon of Cyrene. Not sure, but possibly. And then it says Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, very incredibly, he may have been a foster brother of Herod Antipas, who ruled Galilee, during Jesus' ministry and had John the Baptist put to death. He could have been raised. This guy may have been raised up with Herod. It says, because it says here, brought up with Herod, the teacher. He was brought up with him. So he was somebody who had connections with power and now had forsaken all that to, to have Jesus Christ. So what a diverse church. And then it says, oh, and by the way, who's the last, what's the last word of verse one? Saul. The persecutor, the chief persecutor of the church, now become preacher. What a diverse group. And the church is a diverse group. A bunch of whosoevers, a bunch of people saved from the uttermost to fulfill the great commission together. So it was a diverse church. It was a serving church. Look at what it says. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fast. And that's a beautiful word of ministry, speaking of the priestly work of of a servant of God. We are kings and priests for Jesus Christ. We don't believe in a special class of priests. All of us who are in Christ are priests of Jesus Christ. And that's really the word used there. It says, as they ministered, as they served as royal kings and priests, functioning members in the body of Christ. And then it was a desperate church. How did they show their desperation? What did they do? People often say, is today a day that Christians should fast? <laughs> if you're desperate, if you're desperate for God, you'll fast. I did a study on fasting. I'm not an expert on fasting by any means, but I just did a study on it. And, and I, I found a few places, and this is one of them, where there's actually corporate fasting. Because it says here that as they minister, as they, the church, served and they is the leadership and the church body ministering to the lord and fasting corporate fast i see a corporate fast 
if you go back to, I'm going to just look at one, go to Second Chronicles, chapter number 20, in the days of Jehoshaphat, also in Ezra chapter 8, but we won't go there, but when Ezra was looking for a way to, to bring all the supplies from where he was going uh, back to Jerusalem, they fasted. But here in Second Chronicles chapter 20, we see that Jehoshaphat is literally surrounded in every direction by enemies, and he didn't know what to do. He says, neither know we what to do, but we're going to turn our eyes upon you later on in this passage. But in Second Chronicles chapter 20, where he was surrounded by the Moabites, the Ammonites, and surrounded by them all in verse 1, then verse 2 says, then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, there comes a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea, on this side Syria, so they're from the north, they're from the south, they're from the east, they're from the west, they're coming at Jehoshaphat from every direction, verse 3, if you're there, could you read Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse Three. Who actually who has it? You got it, Raul. Bro, bro, could you please read that? Finally, I'm glad to see a man too put up his hand. We had two wonderful women earlier, Anna and Faith. Thank you. But Raul, if you could read that, please. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. So there, they proclaimed a fast. So I would encourage us, even as we pray for our revival meeting, that we fast on that Friday, June 16th. Now, I don't say that you have to go the whole day without eating. You may. But when I say fast, I, I believe that there's liberty that you could fast uh, as, as the Lord would lead you. But at least maybe skip a meal and give up your breakfast or give up your lunch or give up your dinner or give up your snack or, you know, whatever, you know, fast some part of the day and just give that to the Lord and then just get on your knees and seek God. What I have found about fasting, people fast. When they see no way out and they're desperate because there's no way they can do this without God. That's what I find with fasting. Jehoshaphat had no way to defeat that enemy except God did it. Ezra had no way to bring all those supplies to Jerusalem unless God did it. And the church is under orders. Do you know what we're commissioned to do? We're commissioned to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to every single person on the earth. Now, how are we going to do that? How's this little church going to do that? We got. Are we desperate for that? Do we care? Well, I know we care. That's why we're here. But we ought to care. We ought to have a desperate need. God, every creature, every ethnic, all nations, all the world, to the uttermost, we, we should have a sense of desperation. And that's why we fast. So the Spirit not only speaks personally, but he separates commandingly. He says, separate me. That's a command. The spirit is speaking. Again, it uses the word fasting twice in this passage. So I have it in this point as well, because it says in verse two, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, then the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So notice as well that the men who are separated to serve God are functioning where? They're not functioning outside the church. They're functioning where? In and through the local church. In other words, when God is looking for a servant to fulfill his great commission, he's He's going to speak to the church to send those who are faithfully serving in the church to go out. God doesn't, there's, there's no lone rangers out there. He's not going to call somebody out there that's not in the church to go. He's going to first call that person to come into the church and, and grow, learn, be disciple, get baptized, become a functioning member. And then from out of the church, send the laborers. God's call to serve him is a call to be in fellowship with the local church. God calls men and women from the church to go to the world. Amen? Does that make sense? The church is the instrument of the Holy Spirit, and he can do with the church whatever he wills. The Holy Spirit said, separate me, and the church couldn't fight the Holy Spirit. It is the work of the Holy Spirit working through the local church to equip, to enlist, and to send forth laborers into the world. 
And so there must be a desperation to seek after God. It says when they, they fasted and prayed, and then they kept fasting and praying. When they fasted and prayed, verse 3, repeated. And I just want to encourage all of us, maybe we, we should pray that God would raise up missionaries and pastors in our church. The time is late. We, we should pray that tonight. And we should pray, pray it desperately. And if that's going to happen, people need to come into our church and then actively begin to serve God in the church. That's what takes place. You say, well, I want to be a missionary. Okay, actively serve God in the church. Seek God's face. Pray fast and pray and ask God what he'd have you to do. And then actively serve God in the church. It says they were ministering to the Lord. They were fasting. And it was while that was going on, the Holy Spirit said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul. So the Spirit separates when those are actively involved. G. Campbell Morgan well said, unless he hear that call sounding in his soul, ringing like a trumpet night and day, giving him no rest until he is compelled to say, woe is me if I preach not. We should pray that God would just touch the hearts of men and women. Well, women can't preach like men, but women can be missionaries. We've had, we have single missionaries, single women missionaries. A number of them, we support a wonderful single missionary, uh, two, two single women missionaries in Brazil, except one just got married. So now there's only one. We got two, but, we, but praise God. But when God calls you, into his work it is a woe is me in the soul i remember when god called me to preach as a young man at manhattan bible church on 205th street uptown manhattan and i remember going to church that night and i remember the car i was driving it was a blue fiat and i remember saying to myself as i put my hand on the steering wheel i said god i know you want to do something in my life i'm not exactly sure but i know you want me to preach when I went to church that night, there was a revival, and the evangelist gave an invitation for full-time Christian service. And I said, this is, this is the time God wants me to publicly make known to others that he's called me to preach. And I did, and I went forward. And I just asked the church to pray for me. And we've had people in our church do that, and that's important. But who will surrender to go? These are some of the beautiful young people when we went to Palawan in the Philippines. My, the church was full of young Boys, young men, young ladies serving God throughout the, the all the gospel outreaches. For those of you who've gone to Palawan with us, you'll know. Esther, isn't it amazing? All the wonderful young people there just on fire for the Lord and, and go out and serve the Lord in the different outreaches and their different churches that they have. But we need to have some of that spirit of Isaiah of old. Here am I, Lord. Send me. So the spirit speaks commanded, commandingly. And then we must... Truly, submissively rely on the Holy Spirit of God and let him have his way in your life. So the Spirit speaks personally, and the Spirit separates commandedly, and thirdly, the Spirit sends us powerfully. The Spirit then sends them forth. Notice what it says here. The Spirit sent them, but also who else sent them? The church sent them. So look at verse 3. It says, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So laying hands is a symbolic gesture, but it goes back to the Old Testament. I don't believe there's anything mystical about it, but it's the laying on of hands was to confer authority upon these missionaries who are going forth out of the church. Because he says, separate me barnabas and saul for the work now they weren't being separated from the church they were actually going out through the, the authority of the church but they were going to physically leave so the separation was a physical separation but they were going to continue doing there what the church had been doing in antioch and it says they sent them away so the church sent them and then in verse 4, it says, so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. So what does that tell you? That the church and the Holy Spirit were working in absolute beautiful unity and unison. 
And so they were, as they were sent out by the church, who was the church listening to? The Holy Spirit. So in that sense, they were being sent out by the Spirit. And then it says, and when it says, they sent them away at the end of verse three, I just looked up that little expression. You know, when I've, I found, I, I found that that is often used for people being released out of prison. <laughs> Not that the church is prison, but the idea of being sent, set free, so that the Holy Spirit sends powerfully, they had freedom to go and to act and to serve God, not to do what they wanted to do, but to do what? His work. Because it says, separate unto Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So they were set free to do work. To, to do what? The work of God. Not their own way, not their own will, but the will of God. They had freedom to go and they had the authority to act. One of the greatest days of my life. I, one of the greatest days of my life. Day I was saved, day I was married, but one of the greatest days of my life was the day I was ordained. How could I forget being questioned for six hours by a group of pastors asking me all different kinds of questions? And I and I often felt like Jackie Gleason, you know, a hum and a hum and a hum and a hum and a what? <laughs> you know, but and then at the end of that day, as I did, I didn't say hum and a hum, I did answer their questions well. But at the end of the day, they had a they had a service that night, and the pastor preached from First Timothy chapter four, give yourself wholly to these things. And then they laid hands on me. And I was sent out by that independent Baptist church in Derby, Kansas, to do the work of church planning. So again, it's the church that sends out servants to do the work. It's not mission boards, ultimately. It's not denominations. It's not other kinds of human organizations. It's the church of Jesus Christ that sends forth missionaries and servants of God and gives them the freedom to go and the authority to act. So when I came to New York, nobody said, now, Matt, I want you to start a church in the Bronx. Nobody forced me to start a church on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. I didn't start in the Bronx. I started on Flatbush Avenue. And so the Lord led and directed. What an amazing passage of scripture this is. So I close. As Paul went out with Barnabas, and this is his first missionary journey, and we'll talk more about that in the days ahead. One of my favorite stories is that I've ever heard, honestly, is those two young Moravian men in their 20s they heard of an island in the west indies where an atheist slave owner had upwards to three thousand slaves on this island it was saint thomas saint croix this was back in the 1700s and that owner said no preacher no clergyman will ever stay on this island if he gets shipwrecked we'll make sure he keeps his house over there no one is ever going to talk to my slaves about jesus christ I'm through with that nonsense, that atheist slave owner said. So about 3,000 slaves brought over from the jungles of Africa were confined to the small island in the Atlantic to live and die without hearing about Jesus Christ. These two young Moravian men, Johann Dobar and David Nitschman, heard about this island. And they said, we will sell ourselves as a slave to that slave owner so we can go and preach the gospel to these slaves on that island and so they did they sold themselves as slaves and they used the money they got from from selling themselves as slaves they used that money to buy their their boat and to buy their passage to go to that island in the west indies this was in germany these were young moravian men and as the church from Moravia came to see these two young lads off. They were being sent out by this church. And this wasn't a four-year term. This could have been a for their whole life. It didn't turn out to be, but they didn't know. They didn't know at that moment if they were going to live as slaves the rest of their lives. And as families were weeping, as these two young boys got on that boat, and some people were questioning, is this really wise of these two young men to commit themselves to be slaves? 
to preach the gospel to slaves so that those in slavery could be set free. Some questioned the wisdom of it. And as they got on the boat and the gap widened, those two young men locked their arms together and they held up their other arm and they said that may the lamb that was slain receive the reward, the supper. And that became the rallying cry of Moravian missions. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of the suffering. And that's our reason for existence. Let's pray.